Missions Update. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. It's been an incredible past month. The time has really flown by and I've been busy with the missions project that I've been telling you about and I hope you've been checking up on the timeline. That's where we've been providing the updates over the past few weeks, letting you know what we've been doing and we've also been letting you know what we've been doing in the comment section on the channel too as well. So we've been updating you over this time but we have been extremely busy with the ministry project but the opportunity finally came up and the Lord has given liberty for us to make this video telling you a little bit about what the Lord has been doing over the past few weeks. The incredible work that he's doing here at this important time when we should not be surprised he's calling us to rise up and to shine bright. Now we'll go over the timeline a little bit more toward the end of the video, but I wanted to give you an introduction to the medical missions that we've been doing because a lot of people really don't know what we have been doing and we've been involved with even before we started our YouTube channel. We've been in ministry for a number of years, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the medical mission center here that we call the Brook Cherith, and the name comes from the biblical story of Elijah by the Brook Cherith. But this facility and this information is behind DisasterCrashCourse.com. You can find a little bit more and find our resources on the website there. But the actual facility that we have here, it's not a practicing clinic. It's not a real everyday clinic. But it is a clinic and scenario simulator. Simulating when sudden destruction is going to come and even just regular disasters or if you're in more austere environments, it simulates giving medical care under less than ideal circumstances and when your infrastructure is compromised. So the facility here gives us a simulator where we can be immersed in a model, really think and try different possibilities, different ways to approach different situations and different needs that come up in a medical setting. So it's really an improvisation workshop. It allows us to jury rig and tinker and try different things, different approaches to accomplish what we know is needed in those situations. And we also use it as a classroom, very little firsthand, but for training and developing the materials. So that's the whole purpose of the Brook Cherith right now. Ultimately a classroom to take the learning experiences from what we're doing and pass it on to others. And again, there's a lot of improvisation and trying things out of when you know proper medical protocols and ways of doing things, how do you do it in a situation where you don't have access to a normal medical clinic, hospital, whatever? What do you do during a disaster situation? Maybe you have medical professionals available, but if you don't have the infrastructure in a place that allows them to do what they do best, then you're really crippled. And so we've been focusing on how do you improvise what the medical professionals need during a disaster situation or even just a medical mission situation where you may have less than ideal circumstances. But one of the strengths of the simulator here is it allows us to practice it in real life, actually go through and test and learn all the little tidbits of what works, what doesn't work, ways to optimize it. It gives us the liberty to try things out and actually practice it hands on. And the Lord has provided a place here where we can try different things, even build up and mock up different disaster camps, different aspects of it, and just try different major facilities that would be used in a larger medical setting, such as a kitchen or a laundry center, which we've practiced here. We actually go through practicing all this to make sure it works. Everything we put in our materials, we have actually practiced in the real world. It allows us to try out so many different things, and just things that you can only learn by observation and by being there. There's a lot of information on the internet, but until you try it and actually go through it yourself, there's a lot of information that is lost or overlooked and not passed on. And so what we try to do is actually practice and simulate these settings in these scenarios and pass on even just the smallest of details. Sometimes that will be very important, particularly in a medical setting and disaster setting where you have to give more care to doing things the proper way. But the facility here also allows us to practice it in a wide variety of settings because everybody's situation is going to be different. Even disasters are different. Some will have different resources available. Some infrastructure may still be working. Everybody's scenario is going to be different. And so we practice protocols that are the same regardless of your circumstances. But we just try it with different infrastructure options, ideal methods, emergency methods and options and ideas. We collect all this together. Even how would you do those same protocols in less than ideal circumstances? Very third world or austere situations, disaster settings sometimes. How can you do the same level of care in different infrastructure settings? 
And so this is the main ministry that we have here, is getting all this information, this first-hand knowledge, passing it on and putting it into the booklets, the resource developments. And that's where the real ministry is, not necessarily here at the physical location. This is the simulator, but we pass on the knowledge from here in the booklets. And our first booklet was Volume 1, had a whole variety of information in there. And then Volume 2 was Establishing a Disaster Medical Center. There's so much information in there. Again, even presenting it in different types of infrastructure and situations as well. And then our recent volume three dealt with fluid solutions, the very important role that those play in a medical setting and especially more so in a disaster setting. So this is the core of what we do here at this physical location as we gather information, we try it out, see what works, what doesn't work, and then we pass on that information that can be used by others. But we also have experts review it, different surgeons, different even veterinarians, nurses, those who work in home health care, other areas of health care. We get expert feedback, say here, this is the improvisation methods that we've done. Do you have any ideas or feedback or experiences from your own medical missions that you've gone on? We invite peer review, expert feedback and review of these materials. But we also get the layperson's feedback too, those who don't have a medical background, just the average Joe. And we run this information through them and sometimes put them in these scenarios. And we say, here, do these instructions make sense? And we just observe them sometimes and see how they follow them. And are they easily understood? What are their observations? Things that they learn, little tips and tricks. Things that can only be learned hands-on in a simulator. And then we try to take all those notes and pass them on. But again, it goes through peer review and then layperson's review. We want to make sure the information that we pass on works in the real world. And then once it's all collected, we make it freely available for distribution. It's on our website, DisasterCrashCourse.com. Anybody can download it. We highly encourage you print it out. Put it in a binder. Don't have it just in an electronic version. Print it out. We are called to be the Good Samaritan. That's a command. That's not a suggestion. We've talked about this a lot. Jesus gave the disciples of three different people. Two of them were religious. And this is a big point that we need to observe. When Jesus gave three different examples, he gave two that he did not want us to be like. He did not want us to be religious, but be a Pharisee that we don't care about those who need care and compassion. He wants us to be like the Good Samaritan. There's a lot of hypocrites out there right now. Different Pharisees, they'll even boast and brag that they don't care about those who will be left behind during the tribulation. We're not supposed to be like them. Those are the bad examples in the parable of the Good Samaritan. No, we are called to care. We are called to have compassion. Jesus told his disciples, Go and do thou likewise, just like the Samaritan. And so that's what we try to do with this medical missions, is be like the Good Samaritan, and also giving information to others how they can be like the Good Samaritan too. And we also have the example, though, of the Antioch Christians. We don't have time to go into this in depth, but in Acts 11.26 it says, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. This is an important lesson for us as Christians, because it reminds us the purpose of prophecy. Prophecy is not for a morbid curiosity. Prophecy is a warning of things that are coming. And in this passage, the Christians in Antioch, and they were called Christians because they were Christ-like. They actually lived out being like Christ, and that's why the world called them, Hey, you are Christians. You are Christ-like. You are just like Christ. Because when they knew a need and they heard about a need, they rose up and did something about it. When they heard prophecy, they didn't just say, oh, well, too bad for them. No, they said, what can we do? And let's do what we can do. That is the whole purpose of prophecy, to tell us things that are about to happen so we can do something about what is about to happen. Now, in this passage, the prophecy that they were told about was telling them that famine and great dearth was coming upon the whole world but what popped into their mind was their brethren, which were in Judea. They were not even in Judea right there. They were in Antioch. But they knew that their brethren, who were already persecuted in Judea because they were Christians and they were followers of Christ, they already knew that they were already having a hard time while days were good. But they would be having an even harder time 
once this famine, once this dearth came upon the world. So they knew it was coming, and they decided to help those who would be the most vulnerable, particularly those who were their brethren. And this is a lesson for us. When we see prophecies, when we see signs telling us that sun destruction is coming, we can take action now, according to our ability, whatever that is, to help and aid the tribulation saints in the days ahead, knowing particularly that they're going to have a rougher time than others. And there's a variety of ways and a variety of different ministries that you can do, but one that we encourage you is to print off this medical information, particularly for the tribulation saints in the days ahead, who are going to be going through intense persecution, and we know it, because of prophecy. And again, that's the whole purpose of prophecy, a warning so we can do something before it happens. We know persecution's coming, and we can set aside information now, resources that can help them in the days ahead. And we're at a time where the Lord is even drawing our attention to the needs of medical missions now and in the days ahead, too. Now we have different prayer requests. We ask that you pray for us for wisdom and strength of what the Lord wants us to be doing in this late hour so we can best prepare and help those in the days ahead and then strength to accomplish what we can do to the best of our ability. And then also pray for our financial needs that we can gather the supplies and resources to make the Brook Cherith a place of help, healing, and compassion. And then definitely also pray for specific clinical and medical supplies. There's definitely going to be a large need for them. We know sun destruction's coming in the days ahead. And even the book of Revelation describes the effects of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that are coming. So the more that we can offset and mitigate that, the more of a blessing it can be in the days ahead. And also, particularly with the resources, pray for wisdom for those who read it. Ways that they can use that information and pass it on. Pray that God gives them strength of how to implement it to the best of their ability. And pray for all of us of liberty and efficiency so that we can produce more resources, whether physically or in print form, and efficiency to accomplish what we need to do in the short time remaining. Pray for those who have printed out the resources that it will come across the paths of those who need it. If you have printed out these resources or other resources, whatever you have left behind for those in the days ahead, pray over it that the Lord will multiply it and use it greatly, that God will bless the resources and those in the days ahead who read it, and that God will give them wisdom on further steps that they need to take and can take as well. We are at an amazing time, and seeing how the medical missions fits in with everything we have seen recently further underscores the importance of this prophetic time, the time we are at right now, and then what we should be doing right now, and what the Lord has particularly drawn our attention on our end to be doing right now. We see in a couple of days astronomical events with another blood moon. We also see reminders to be awake. This is not a time to be sleeping. This is a time to be rising up and shining bright. But what we see in the days ahead with the blood moon eclipse should instantly remind us of what we've seen recently, too, with the other eclipse that took place on the ecliptic, which started off the Revelation 12 signs, a whole series of signs that we saw. Now, around the middle of November is when we saw the signs, particularly relating to the Revelation 12 sign, taper off. So that caught our attention that the story was tapering off, was ending, but it reminded us we have seen the signs. And what is the purpose of the signs? Signs tell us that he is near. We always have to keep this in mind. People look to the signs as the day of the rapture. No, Jesus told us what the conclusion of the signs were. He said it means that he is near. He's not there yet, but he's near. He's really, really close. And so we got to keep this in mind when we look back on what we saw last year, and even the months and years leading up to that point, always remember the signs only mean he is near. We look up, we lift up our heads, that tell us our redemption is nigh. That means we should then get ready. So we're not surprised that shortly after that was the time of Hanukkah with all those messages and lessons there that tied into what Jesus said and told his disciples about. So many warnings about the trumpet call at midnight. The whole purpose is to tell us that the bridegroom is right over the hill. He is not at the door. So right after we see the signs that tell us he is near, we should not be surprised that the immediate following parable and just the timing and the symbolism there at that time fits in exactly with the rest of the story. What should we be doing when we know he is near? We should be rising up. We should be going out to meet him. We should be shining bright. It's a sequence here. This is the sequence Jesus even told his disciples it would happen in. The signs will only tell you that he is near. They're going to stop. And you need to be busy before he gets to you. And so we're in a time of delay right now between the second watch, which we just left, and we've just entered into the third watch at that same time. 
which again is the prime time when Jesus was alluding to his disciples that the servants should be expecting their master to return. We're right there. Everything's happening right in the exact order and sequence that's expected. And I've said this before. I am not at all surprised at what the Lord is doing here with the medical ministry, the work in my own life, the work that he's doing in others' lives too as well, different ministries that he's calling people to, things how he's calling them to rise up in their own lives and their own families right now. The Lord is calling us to rise up right now. And when we look at the timeline, when we compare, what have we seen? What are we seeing right now? There is a delay in the story, in the signs, in the instructions that Jesus left us. We will know he's nigh, then what are we doing? So I'm not surprised at all that the Lord has been calling my focus, particularly to the finalization efforts here at the Brook Chair, to get it ready for those in the days ahead, and then to share the resources and the information with you over the internet as well, so you can print it off and you can be like the Good Samaritan too. We are at a delay time that's meant for action. Just like the Christians in Antioch, they heard the prophecy of what was coming, then they decided, hey, let's do something. So we're in a time of action right now, a delay time, knowing he's real close, he's nigh, he's near, let's go out to meet him. Now, if you've been keeping up on the timeline, you've been having an idea of what we've been working on in this time over the past month, but I just want to hit a few of the highlights just to show you how incredible the Lord's been working during this time. Back around November 11th was our last video where we announced Volume 3 and we encouraged you to print it out and to share it with others. And we also told you that we were going to be busy with this and that you needed to be checking the timeline, which you still need to do. We are at a busy time here on this end, so definitely keep it up. We'll keep you updated in the timeline. But we happened to mention that we were having a scheduled second clinic review tour with a medic coming down to really help finalize different details here at the Brook Cherith. Now before I go further, I want to introduce you to this medic because it's incredible how the Lord brought him across our path, different things that the Lord is doing at this time to help us get everything ready. So let me go ahead and introduce Brother Dane. Hi, my name is Dane Lohman. A couple of weeks ago, my friend Jamie and I were listening to Brother Dan's quick report that he put out where he was describing his his process of making normal sailing, of authoring the, the Disaster Crash Course Volume 3, and some of the work that he's doing there at Brook Cherith uh, Medical Mission Center. And Jamie noted, she said, Dane, this sounds a lot like what you did when you were in the Air Force. Why don't you touch base with Daniel Vallis and see if maybe there's, there's some way you two can connect or if you can help out or encourage or any of that. So I took Jamie's advice and did, and and lo and behold, I was I was very privileged, very blessed um, that that Brother Dan asked me to contribute uh, if I would look see if what he was doing is valid and offer any advice or opinion that I can. So in working with him over the last oh, couple of weeks, uh, he asked if I wouldn't mind doing this just by way of introduction and tell you a little bit about myself and what qualifies me to be to be able to do that. So I guess in part. My medical background began when I was in high school. Um, I, I actually I became an emergency medical technician, and I worked in a very rural part of eastern California, the High Sierras, and throughout the high desert in Nevada, and started my, my medical background early on. And from there, I transitioned. Um, I joined the Air Force right after graduating high school, became a medic, and my career went from there. I ended up spending just just over 26 years in the Air Force before I retired in 2010. While I was in the Air Force, I started out flying medevac or aeromedical evacuation, where basically we would transport patients from Germany or, or from Europe uh, or from the Pacific, and they would be patients in, in all different ranges of severity. And we would transport them on, on aircraft, fly them, and we would have to take care of them, keep them alive, tend to their, their medical needs and their comfort needs uh, throughout some, some pretty long, grueling situations as, as we brought them back to the hospitals here in mainland United States. Part of the, the training and the qualification for that involved also going to various survival schools, learning how to take care of patients, how to take care of ourselves uh, if we should crash or something like that in some very different environments. So I did that for about five years and then continued on where I ended up working in and eventually managing um, emergency rooms, family practice clinics, surgery clinics throughout my career until I became what's known as an independent duty medic. In doing that, what is an independent duty medic? There's really no civilian equivalent to that. 
but we're we're very highly trained medics. We are trained to be, I guess you would say, a physician extender. Where the Air Force, it's not logistically or or financially possible to send an entire healthcare team to very remotely uh, remotely peopled areas, some very austere locations. So we're trained to be oh, kind of the the care equivalent of a physician assistant and in how to take care of a a patient in everyday medical needs, emergency situations, emergency dental situations. Our our primary focus is keeping people healthy so we don't have to work. So we do a lot of preventive medicine, environmental health, site sanitation, hygiene. We're trained in laboratory procedures. We maintain our own pharmacies and and everything that kind of goes along with that. So it was a very grueling 400-hour course that I went through. In addition to that, I became very interested in, you know, if we're going to be stuck out in the middle of nowhere, or if we're going to be taking care of uh, civilian populations through who knows what kind of situations, it would be wise to, to get a little bit more education behind it. So I attended West Virginia University, their School of Medicine. Um, They have a tropical medicine course. And that's where you learn about all the weird diseases that that take place typically in developing countries. In addition to that, I also entered in, I became a fellow candidate in the Wilderness Medical Society in their uh, wilderness medicine program. That's how to take care of people in all different environments from those who go trekking up to Mount Everest to those who go diving to the, you know, in the ocean in different areas or trekking through the deserts or what have you. And it's a, it was a both very good, very intense programs. As this got incorporated into my Air Force career, I was given the opportunity first and foremost to deploy in some of the older style mobile medical units where we would pack up in a tent and deploy anywhere in the world and then take care of patients out of that. And when I say patients, we were typically responsible for for a group as small as six people and we would tend to them out of a backpack all the way up to about 400 people or sometimes up to a thousand plus depending on the location. And part of our job was not only taking care of them but designing and building the resources, the supplies that are behind it to be able to do so. So we started out with some of the older units that were very heavy, took up a lot of space, and I had the opportunity to be able to design and build my own layout. Sometimes that took the form of, you know, a a random building that we might be able to use or contract trailers that would be brought into a specific location. And it was almost a rite of passage for the IDMT to be able to design and build their own clinic to equip it um, and then make sure that it works so that, that we could deliver the health care. And in doing so, there were different size requirements where we would build a mobile medical unit, sometimes just to take care of 20 people. Sometimes we'd be taking care of 400 people. And we had to somehow formulate what kind of supplies do we need? What are the common injuries and ailments that we'll be taking care of? What sort of ancillary services do we need? What can I do in terms of laboratory? What's going to make the most difference? You know, you can have the most elaborately outfit laboratory, but if you, if it really doesn't provide value to what you're, to the care that you're going to be able to deliver, it's just a waste of money. So what can you do? What are the basics that we could do that would uh, give us the most bang for the buck? And so we delivered those and put those together. And that's some of what you're seeing here packages that we could take care of people. Um, and we would do so in some very extreme, very austere locations, as, as pictured here. And ultimately, what one of my main operating goals was, was to design, order, equip, test out, make sure that it worked, and then be able to deliver sustained medical care to 400 personnel for a period of 30 days, regardless of the location, before we would be able to receive resupply. And all of that we had um, to turn around and then package into a relatively small container and transport it throughout the world. And then, of course, we had to be able to brief people on this, what we do, educate them. But then also we we were responsible to higher authority saying, hey, this is how the money that you gave us was spent. This is what it delivers. This is what we can bring to the table in terms of delivering medical care. And so we were we were held very accountable for everything that we did. And Jamie was right, you know, when she pointed this out. What Brother Dan has done here, he has he has set out on this on this labor of love, on this labor of service unto the Lord, 
in designing this clinic and educating people on how what is their best way that they're going to be able to survive a disaster situation. And it's not just a matter, you know, anyone can do that. You can glean all of this information through several blogs, through several websites. But what really sets Brother Dan apart is that not only did he do the research, but he turned around and he proved it. He procured, purchased the resources, and then he tested them to see, hey, does this work? And you'll see that through the three publications that he's put out in terms of the disaster crash course, but also in the glimpses that you see around Brooke Cherith. And then he's invited others in, including myself, to to ask for opinion. Does this work? Am I on track on this? Does this not work? And and it's very well validated. So everything you see has been proven. He's proven it himself. He's run it by his peers. Does this actually work? Is What have you seen in your experience? And then ultimately, as a good steward of the Lord, he's turned around and, and said, hey, this is this is what I'm asking you to participate in. This is what you can participate in. And this is some of the expense behind it. So it's all, he, he's holding himself very accountable for everything that you see. And I'm very impressed by that. And indeed, everything that he's done, it has value. It works. Uh, it's been proven. It's very, very feasible, very viable, very doable. In caring for human lives, um, I'll just end with this comment. The thing that makes this most valuable is that it extends life. It extends life. It, it ministers to others to the point that it points to the cross. It points to salvation in Christ Jesus. It offers his mercy, his love, his grace, his salvation, and the opportunity to accept that and receive that before it's too late. Each step of the way throughout this, you'll see references, you'll see points. Everything points back to Jesus. Everything points back to the things that he's done, and indeed he is the great physician. So it's it's very much a privilege, it's very much an honor um, to be able to take part in this, and um, I look forward to continuing and seeing where this goes. So thank you very much for the for this opportunity to introduce myself, and I just I thank the Lord for what he's bringing together here, and may it serve and glorify him. Lord's blessings. Thank you, Brother Dane. Now he was coming down on the 16th to help review, and we've been corresponding a lot and just consulting and comparing notes and finding out what we need just from a professional's point of view. So he's going to come down on the 16th and help review and then make final suggestions for any changes and getting things in place. But one unique thing that the Lord did on the morning that Brother Dane arrived was the Lord provided donations to this ministry to purchase supplies that we needed. And he did it on the morning that Brother Dane was about to start the review. And it arrived very early in the morning. This is important because we knew of very significant financial needs for instruments and resources and equipment that were needed. We had talked about this weeks before this even, and we had even thought about making a video just talking about some of these needs and presenting them and sharing them with you like we had done before with some of the other resources. But even though we created all the slides for the video and got everything ready, we even had Brother Dane record different things talking about some of the pieces of critical equipment, the Lord never gave liberty to actually make the video, which I thought was always very interesting. We had the material ready to make the video even before our last video, but the Lord did not give specific liberty to share those needs, and I always wondered about that. But it's interesting on this day that he actually arrived, and we were going to talk about some more of those needs and just what we would do because we did not have them. It was amazing how the Lord provided in a particular way that showed that he was in complete control. Very few other people actually knew about the needs and the expense that we had, but the Lord provided donations on the morning that he arrived to give consulting about these needs. The Lord provided the funds that almost completely covered all of the needs that we had. It was so amazing how the Lord worked. And to see that on the morning that he arrived, when we saw that and I shared that with them, it gave such liberty to the day going forward, knowing how the Lord was behind what we were doing and calling us to this particular need at this very time. He not only brought Brother Dane across our path for the consulting and the experience and just the know-how, he also provided the funds on the day that he brought him across our path to make all this happen. And it's been incredible. I could share so many other stories. But in a way, it was not a surprise. Because we were doing what we knew the Lord wanted us to do, we were taking the steps according to our ability, but it was a pleasant surprise, but in a way I wasn't surprised. 
because I was expecting and I knew the Lord was already working here at this important time with this particular focus. And again, that gave great liberty throughout the day. Just We were able to go forward and make recommendations knowing that the Lord was meeting these needs that we knew were present. And the critical equipment that we needed, we'd be able to put it into place. And so we were able to plan and do our review accordingly. It really changed the whole outcome of the whole day. The Lord gave so much wisdom and liberty, accomplished so much on that day. And that was on December 16th. And of course, then we had to follow up with it and do a lot of work. And we purchased a lot of the supplies, but then also the Lord brought in another large particular donation that helped make up for the lack of the previous ones and just help cover things that came to light, just smaller things that would go with the other resources that we hadn't anticipated. The Lord was providing as we took the steps forward in faith. And this is what caught our attention, particularly even at the Hanukkah time, right at the midnight hour, so to speak. To see the Lord working, calling us to rise up and to shine bright, to go forward, to go out to meet Him. And this is what has been so incredible over this past month, to see how the Lord works. As we go forward in action, according to our ability, the Lord makes the way because He's the one we're going out to see. So we got a lot of work done, and particularly around December 24th, some of the major upgrades were finished, just as resources and instruments and equipment. Some of the major, very core needs were met and finished up by then, which definitely made me feel a lot better. But then the Lord also provided for just some follow-up needs, just additional resources and supplies that we would need more of. The Lord has provided as we've gone forward. But it was around January 1st that we had some major cold weather issues become apparent. We had a particular blast of cold weather come down here in Alabama. And around that time we got a bunch of snow and freezing weather. And normally we have somewhat mild winters down here in central Alabama, but this was almost a week of freezing weather. But it was interesting because this place is a simulator. And it's neat just to see how the Lord brought our attention to issues that would relate to the cold, whether heating or water lines freezing or whatnot. He brought our attention to those in real time because that's what this place practices and simulates. We experienced it, and it was cold, definitely. And we were able to see the strain on the furnace and just different strains on the system that needed to be addressed, but they weren't necessarily as critical as the core issues that the Lord had already provided. And so this was interesting to see how almost a funneling effect, the Lord has taken care of the core critical issues, and then now focusing to particular important infrastructure issues. There's a funneling down, a finalizing, getting the place ready. You know, he's not providing these funds and everything so it will sit on the shelf for another year or even a month. He is getting it ready to go. And this has caught our attention. And so that was on January 1st, and we've been working mostly since then on these cold weather issues because, again, cold weather, it's hard to work outside in these issues. But we've had to reroute ductwork for heating just to optimize the heat, reduce heat loss. We had to majorly insulate the water lines. I had to do a lot more crawling through crawl spaces than I really wanted to ever do. But we've been really busy. The cold weather brought attention to firewood needs and just the amount of heat that we would need on very low temperatures for us here in this area and just anticipating future needs and also considering it. It really took us down mental paths to consider things that we hadn't really explored in depth before. We had addressed them somewhat before, but this allowed us to really see, okay, we need to take these a little bit further than they are right now. And it definitely drew attention to the need for heat and supplies that they would need to heat. And we're already stocking up firewood for them. And we got another load coming in this weekend too as well. It definitely has drawn attention to needs that are going to be a lot more amplified in the days ahead. When particularly there's going to be power out, probably a grid down situation. When you read the book of Revelation with the four horsemen, it's a very dire picture with a quarter of the world's population dying. And so the events that happened recently with the cold weather really helped us anticipate that it's going to be colder than even normal cold and just make some infrastructure changes and adaptions accordingly to what we know is coming. Just like the Christians at Antioch who had the prophecy about what was coming, they're able to anticipate those needs. And you will remember about a month ago, we shared with you how we had built a patient tent and many of you chipped in and donated to help make this possible not only for the flooring and the tent but also the supplies that went with it and it also allowed us to purchase different medical supplies and heating supplies and more blankets and just additional supplies that are needed in a medical facility 
but you'll remember how quickly it happened once the funds came in to build this particular patient tent. So we have an area, once they do come out of surgery or trauma area or triage, whatever, they could come to a patient area where you'd at least have a warm place where we could put them until they could be taken somewhere else. And most of the Brook Cherith is really designed as a temporary solution. It's a stopgap. Once sun destruction comes and the grid goes down or whatever, this is only a temporary solution to hold them over until they can organize something a little better in the community. But it does allow us to practice and simulate information that we could pass on for others around the world too, regardless of their particular scenarios. But this is one aspect of the book chariot that you were able to participate in particularly and help see the results. And it definitely increased our space to even address the patient care after surgery. And that's one thing about a medical setting is it's not just one or two areas. You have to have several multiple areas all in place at once because they all work together. If you don't have one area, you'll feel it in the other areas because you have to take them somewhere. And your funds also provide for a great walkway between the OR area and the patient tent holding area. But is again this cold weather time, this simulation, if you will, of a taste of what's coming in the days ahead that really allowed us to go through mental exercises of realizing there were other things that could be done. And Brother Dane, because of his background, particularly in mobile clinics, was a great help in providing tips and just notes from his own observations, things he's tried, and we were able to bolster up the patient tent. Just a lot of little changes that made a huge difference, and we could do different tests with the heating and temperature and just see a huge difference in the temperature inside. and Being able to keep the patients a lot more comfortable with what they're already going to be going through, and also the staff as well. So it's been incredible... We've been able to make upgrades, and this is what we've been working on over the past few days, particularly having our focus more drawn toward the patient areas, the patient care. Now that the OR areas are well established in heating and water, electrical and everything, he's drawing our attention again and narrowing down to just simpler needs that can be quickly addressed, particularly with patient care. And that's definitely one area we could have a lot better here, and that's what we've been working on. So where we are right now, this is what we're working on. Patient care, there's still... A lot to do. We got a whole to-do list on my desk right now. Things that can be done just to optimize the possibilities of this Brook Cherith for those in the days ahead. And this is what the Lord is calling us to at this time. By immersing us back into this medical clinic, we've almost been living in it. And that really gives us an idea of what it feels like from the patients and the staff's perspective. Really see things that they would notice. And it really allows us to experience, if I was a patient here during a really cold night such as this, what would I be going through? And just allows us to anticipate needs and to mitigate those as much as possible. But we've been noticing that the patient care area could be done a lot better. And we have the patient tent here, but as you can see, it can only hold about two beds. And right now we have an exam area in here as well. If we took that out, we could fit two more beds in here, and we do have two more beds somewhere else. But right now we have a very limited patient care ability. And obviously with sun destruction coming, it's probably going to be overwhelmed real quickly. So we know this is a need, but like we saw with the construction of this tent, we know we can address it rather quickly. And so that's what we're working on right now. The current patient tent is limited because it only holds currently two and an exam area and a nurse's workstation. And so to optimize it, what we've been planning is to build something very similar, just longer, called the patient wing. And it allows to consolidate the two beds we have in another completely different area, bring them all together, and also expand the number of beds that we can have, and basically consolidate a lot of things together. It makes things a lot more efficient with power, water, heating, have a whole dedicated patient wing, everything in one location, and we'll turn the existing patient tent into a place for those who are dying. And unfortunately, this is going to be a harsh reality in the days ahead, particularly during the time of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the Bible tells us it's going to be a very harsh time. And so we want to be able to address that with mercy and compassion, just like the Good Samaritan. There's a lot that we will not be able to do for them, but we can at least make them comfortable and demonstrate compassion. And so we want to have a dedicated tent area for that. It also is part of a normal triage system anyway, having a dedicated place for them and where their family can sit with them. So that is the plan for what we're working on right now. Again, you saw how quickly the patient tent went up previously. It really went up in one single evening. It was a crazy work evening, but we got it all set up, built, and ready to go that evening. And then the next day, we just finished out some of the landing and the decking for the gurneys getting up to the OR. So we know this can happen real quickly, 
and we're just basically doing the exact same thing just a little bit longer we're just basically combining three different tents to make a long patient wing and already we're mocking up a layout just getting an idea of where we can place this on the facility we have a very good idea of how we're going to approach it so right now we're mocking it up and getting plans ready but it will definitely greatly consolidate so many things. We'll be able to use the other patient area for the exam area. We'll be able to move different things around. It's going to optimize multiple other areas that we have known about and different issues, just the inefficiency of them, greatly increase the efficiency of the patient care overall and also allow us to more compassionately meet the needs of the dying too. If you would like to be a part of this ministry and particularly this patient care aspect, definitely keep us in prayer. We need wisdom. We need strength. We also need material supplies. If you would like to donate, here is our PayPal address and also a direct link to our PayPal link. You can also find this in the description box. Thank you so much for your support and for your prayers. It makes a huge difference. And it is incredible to see oftentimes the timing of how the Lord works all together. When we all give according to our ability, like the Christians in Antioch, the Lord can multiply it and bless it in amazing ways. We are at a time with so many reminders that we need to be rising up. We need to be shining bright. We need to be going out to meet the bridegroom. This is a time of action. We have seen the signs that tell us he's not. So what are we doing? Are we rising up? Are we doing something? Are we considering prophecy? And are we acting on it? Are we living in faith? Shall he find faith when he comes? Will he find us living as though we know he's coming? We're in the third watch proportionally of the year, and in the days ahead we see the total lunar eclipse, the blood moon, which is also a super moon. It's also going to be technically a blue moon too. So it's an interesting astronomical event on January 31st. Again, that reminds us of the signs that tell us he's nigh. It reminds us of the blood moons that caught the world's attention, really caused a lot of people to look up and start considering the astronomical pictures. And it's also when the moon is going to be at the ascending node, rising above the ecliptic right at Leo again. And again, this is what it's been doing over this entire time, going back to even the start of the Revelation 12 sign. Always doing this right at Leo the lion, drawing our attention to the lion of the tribe of Judah all during this time, still reminding us when we do look up, when we lift up our heads, even now. When the world is going to be looking at the blood moon in the days ahead, still going to be pointing at the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has redeemed us and purchased us. We have all these reminders coming together. But then it's also going to be a blood moon, which reminds us of the events which started the learning journey for many people. But particularly for me, when I consider the blood moons in context of what's going on right now in the broad picture, but also what the Lord's doing at the book Cherith, this is important on a personal level because my brother Matt pointed this out to me the other day. I just had not made the connection before. But the Brook Cherith, particularly the operating room center, that particular building, that was dedicated on April 15th, 2014, the same day as the first blood moon. And this definitely caught my attention how the Lord is bringing multiple things, our journey, our, our life journey, our life experiences recently, bringing it all together, bringing it full circle even. I am not at all surprised that he's bringing particularly my attention back to the book Cherith at this time, a finalizing, something that was dedicated and started back at the first blood moon. And we've added and done work on it here and there since then and produced different booklets. But to have the main core of it dedicated on the same day as the first blood moon, and here we are at a time leading up to the first blood moon since that series, just past all the other signs we've seen, this has caught my attention, but I am not surprised to see the Lord working. We have seen the signs, and that tells us he's nigh even at the doors. We've seen what he's been doing in our own lives. We see it in the news. I'm reminded almost every single day of what the Lord has been doing back since the end of October, of where he's really ramped up the urgency to finalize his needs, but also made us aware through prophecy of some of the particular needs that they will have in the days ahead, during the days of the dearth and the famine and the persecution. We know by prophecy what's coming. That's for us to do something about it. And we see so many regular reminders how important what the Lord has brought our attention. Not just mine, but yours too. Because you've been following this channel and you've been aware of these needs. You've been seeing the hurricane news and just the IV news. You know what's coming down the pipe prophetically. But you have also been aware that it's going to be a medical disaster in the days ahead too. We're reminded of this. We're reminded of the importance of what the Lord is drawing all of our attention to right now. How hospitals even right now are having to improvise and do different methods of IV injections and solutions to meet needs right now under ideal circumstances even. 
And you'll see even recent news articles talking about how with the flu going on, that's even made the situation with the IV shortage even worse. Now, particularly our country, America, is really close to a full-blown medical disaster just because of the shortage. It's not going to take much to really throw things completely out of whack. When you read these articles, you really see how they emphasize the critical role that IV solutions play, even in things like the flu. We have seen the signs already. That tells us he's near. That is the conclusion we are to draw when we look at the signs. We lift up our heads. We look up. That only tells us he is nigh. We need to then rise up and go out to meet him knowing he is nigh. Are we doing that? Are we asking the Lord for wisdom of what we should be doing now? Definitely look at the timeline and allow this to help you review things that we've seen. Things that have told us he's nigh. Our redemption, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's nigh. He's at the door. He's just over the hill. The bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Do something with your life to go out to meet him. Jesus emphasized in Luke 12, 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. Notice that Jesus emphasizes what he is going to be looking for, and that the reward is conditional. The reward for those servants is only given to those servants if he finds them so. This isn't for all servants. It's not for all disciples. It's not for all those who claim to be followers of Christ. No, it's just for the ones that he finds actually living and serving him. Their life is watching. It's not just lip service. They are living as though he is about to return. They are busy with the king's business according to their ability. This is what he's looking for. This is the question we need to ask ourselves right now. We have seen the signs. We have heard the calls. We've seen so many things that tell us sudden destruction is coming. What are we doing? How is our master, how is our bridegroom, how is our redeemer, the lion of the tribe of Judah, how is he going to find us? When we think of the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus gave and told his disciples, be like this guy, he also gave examples of two that he said, don't be like them. Of these three, how will our Redeemer find us? Will we be the Pharisees that say, I don't care about those in the days ahead? The religious people who know prophecy, who know what's coming, but they don't care, they just pass on by, even though they see it. Even though they come over and gawk at the needs, they know the needs, they'll talk about the needs, they know what's coming. They'll talk about it, but they don't care. They just keep on going. They're just looking out for what's in it for them. No, we need to be like the Good Samaritan. It will cost us time, money, energy, focus. You know, the Good Samaritan, he ministered to one single person. And Jesus said, go and do that likewise. He's not calling us all to do great big things. He says, do like this guy. He met the needs. He showed compassion on one single person. He made a difference in their world. He changed their world. You know, we can't make a difference in the world until we make a difference in our world first, if we change our lives. And Jesus has told us that we will see these signs that tell us he's not at the door. That's why we need to be ready, therefore. Because we know he's nigh. He's almost here. He's not here yet. But we know he's close enough to where we need to be rising up and shining bright. We need to be making ourselves ready. That means we need to be purifying ourselves, we need to be sanctifying ourselves, we need to be casting off the works of darkness. And when we do, then we can be a vessel that the Master can use, a vessel unto honor. And this is what he wants to find us doing when he arrives. He wants to find us a vessel for his glory, who's bringing forth fruits in their life, who's living like a Christian should live, who's allowing their heart, their life, their mind, their soul to live in expectation that their Lord is about to return. This is how we rise up. This is how we shine bright. This is how we make ourselves ready. We have heard the prophecies. We have heard the signs. We know what's coming. What are we doing about it? What does that reflect about us? What is the world going to say about us? What are our neighbors, our family going to say about us? Will they call us Christians, Christ-like, or will they call us hypocrites? If the world calls you a hypocrite now, don't be surprised if Jesus calls you a hypocrite as well. Now is a time, now is a delay for us to examine ourselves. We know it's coming. Are we rising up? Are we trimming our lamps so that we can shine bright? Are we acting wisely? Are we going forth in faith? 
Are we the wise servants who are occupying till he comes? Let's rise up. Let's shine bright. Let's go forward together. Let's provoke one another. Let's encourage one another to love and do good works. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. Let's love our Redeemer and let's serve him first and highest above all else. Maranatha.